Friends, I am Dr. Amdekar. In the first of this new series, which we have titled as Early Clinical Diagnosis, in the very first video, I discuss how important it is. We are all aware that early diagnosis as early as possible when the patient presents is possible to define anatomy and also microanatomy, following which a pathology and the etiology as a guesswork based on epidemiology is all possible with detailed history and we call it a history which is thoughtful, a thought in action where every question has a purpose and every answer leads to the next important question. When this is possible in majority of the patients, almost 80 to 85 percent, and the physical examination can further fine-tune the diagnosis and the etiology can be assessed based on epidemiological experience. Today we know that oxygen saturation is a probable part of the physical examination itself because we don't want to wait for hypoxia to manifest clinically and today we can even diagnose early before the first symptom comes up like what we do in a routine cold blood screening for say hypothyroidism or a colonoscopy on adults beyond 40-45 years to pick up a colon cancer and science has further gone to even diagnose early even before disease starts like when there is an index case we can do some genetic studies to find out the risk of such a disease even before the disease starts. That is important. However, in the next video, Dr. Chokani discussed a very important aspect of a clinical diagnosis early enough in an acute bacterial infection. Friends, it is possible to differentiate a probability of an acute bacterial infection as against many other causes of fever and once you are able to do it, then you can use antibiotics very rationally and today misuse of antibiotics is a very big problem all over the world and of course with us also. He emphasized that an acute bacterial infection can be suspected in the first two, three days even without localization by a fact that the patient continues to look sick even in interfebral period. And of course, by now, by day three, day four, you have a localizing symptoms. Therefore, we could use this early diagnosis at least for a rational antibiotic therapy. And in other issues, when you are sure it's not an acute bacterial infection, one can always wait to see the progress. And in the next few days, you can almost group a reasonable correct diagnosis. In the following video, Dr. Mahesh Moite discussed an early clinical diagnosis of non-infective cough. Friends, he emphasized that sometimes a low-grade fever may be missed and a disease like tuberculosis with a chronic cough, apparently non-infective but really infective as is seen by a loss of appetite, loss of weight, etc. And therefore, you must keep that in mind. Of course, a disease like pertussis where the fever is often forgotten but the cough keeps on worsening progressively is another example of what appears to be non-infective cough. And then you may have to decide whether it's an acute onset cough like an ill foreign body or a micro aspiration. And if it's a dry cough, it could be a GERD or maybe a mediastinal tumor compression. And if it's a wet cough without fever, it could be a damaged airway like a bronchiectasis. In the following video, Dr. Tushar Manier discussed a clinical early diagnosis of a non-infective diarrhea. And he made a point that sometimes an inflammatory bowel disease may look like an acute bacillary dysentery, but a severe toxicity, a severe colicky pain, tenismus, as against not so severe pain, and not so florid acute onset may differentiate an inflammatory bowel disease as a non-infective element. But many times 
there may not be fever at all in a non-infective diarrhea and it could be either because of a very mild persistent inflammatory disorder like a celiac disease for example or an eosinophilic gastroenteritis. Of course it could be due to drug induced diarrhea itself or some causes of indigestion and therefore a malabsorption. But a typical malabsorption presents as a child who has retained his appetite but still diarrhea continues and you are able to fish out easily a difference between a carbohydrate malabsorption because of a lot of gases, distension and an anal excoriation and a fat malabsorption with an infrequent but large stools often foul smelling and it could be also due to infection but without fever like in giardiasis. Thereafter, in the next video, Dr. Rajesh Chokani discussed an early clinical diagnosis of an autoimmune disorder. He said that occasionally the fever that is continued for four or five days without any obvious localizing symptom, but the young infant or a toddler is very irritable, we must keep in mind the Kawasaki syndrome and many other chronic autoimmune disorders may not have an obvious trigger of infection but present as arthritis or also glossitis or changes on the skin, rash, nail bed, etc. The further progress in such diseases makes us diagnose a probable autoimmune disorder. But he also said that sometimes an autoimmune localizing disease like autoimmune encephalitis or autoimmune hepatitis can also mimic an infective condition and if you give a thought and get the details history you can suspect an autoimmune localized organ disease. In the last video in this first series on early clinical diagnosis I talked about the infection triggered immune disorders. Friends we all know that uh, often viral infection but sometimes even a bacterial infection or an infection like tuberculosis may have a lot of immune manifestations or a complication. We are all aware when such a complication follows within a day or two of a recovering illness like a dengue fever with capillary leak syndrome but at times it takes few weeks before an immune complication occurs as happens commonly in rheumatic fever where the symptoms of rheumatic fever come about two weeks after a streptococcal infection has completely got cured. But these immune responses to infection are so funny that they could occur even after weeks or months. And we all know that in recent pandemic of COVID-19 infection we all have witnessed, seen or read about the immune response of a myocardial damage coming even after several weeks or months after a successful eradication of that viral infection and disease. We also know that sometimes the immune complications after an infection may occur after several years as happens with an SSPE a subacute sclerosing panencephalitis following a measles infection in early childhood and an SSP in an older child. Why does such late responses occur? They occur either because the latent virus continues to be lurking in some of the tissues in the body and then reactivates or sometimes it could be the fault of an immune system what is referred to as a reprogramming. And friends, the whole idea of knowing that infection could trigger an immune response even weeks, months or years after the infection is over is only to remind us that when you suspect an autoimmune disorder or an immune disorder of unknown origin, you must go back not only just few days back but even weeks or months or years back to find out whether there could be some correlation with this. I hope you have enjoyed this first series 
and the next series will also continue to talk about an early clinical diagnosis and I hope you continue to join with us. Thank you very much.